Ravi, we often hear that when we read the Bible, we should put it in context. My question is, how can we do so accurately when something that happened so long ago and the period when it was written can't be exactly pinpointed? How is it possible? I think it's, uh, it's a very good question because any text without a context can become a pretext. You can use it for your own advantage. See, there are linguistic specifics, there are cultural specifics, but there are also interpretive parameters that are clearly given to us. We may not always be able to get 100% accuracy in that, but we know very well when the language has meaning and particular implications that we can understand truthfully what exactly is being said. I mean, it would be a postmodernist view would say that the reader is authoritative over the author, that the reader reserves the right to interpret it in any way they wish to interpret it. But the fact of the matter is the author has an intention. If we take the Bible to be what it claims to be the word of God, inspired by God and preserved by God, certainly God can also give us the wisdom to understand what he means by it. Otherwise, it will be pointless to preserve something that cannot be completely understood. When the Bible says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. What is there to try and figure out contextually that is so difficult? He loves the world. He gave his son that when you believe in him, he gives you eternal life. Its starting point is filial, God the Father. Its objective is relational. And ultimately you go through the range being eternal and the specific nature of it being legal. Sin is a term of violation against the character and the law of God. But God as the Father provides the remission of sins through the provision of his son. Now, you may have some texts that have cultural issues related to them, but that is not the fundamental starting point of the teaching of scripture. The fundamental starting point is that God in pursuit of you sends his son so that you and I may gain eternal life. We have enough commentators, we have enough cultural understanding by which we can truly interpret what the passage is intended to teach. If you say, for example, that because it happened 2,000 years ago, therefore we cannot really understand it, think of what you're going to do with all of ancient literature. Just consider it as pointless and meaningless because we cannot understand it. Authors who are writing today, if the world still exists 200 years from now, are we going to say the readers then are not going to understand exactly what we are going to say? You see. The Bible doesn't say in the beginning was video. It says in the beginning was the word. And truth is primarily the property of propositions. So we read the text, we understand the context, and deliver ourselves from making it a pretext and apply it in life. Let me put it in a simple way now. There are four points to all interpretation. Listen carefully. Identification, translation, persuasion, justification. Identification, translation, persuasion, justification. The scriptures identify clearly with our need. The scripture writers identify. We can come to terms on what that identification is. When we put it into another language, the translation is those truths in our idioms. Persuasion, there are illustrations given to persuade us of that truth, and then justification, why the statements given claim to be true. All language has its limitations, but you can have a meaningful understanding of what is being said, even if you do not have a perfect understanding of what is being said. That's what Jesus said, that he gives the Holy Spirit for us to understand it in personal application, but Peter also says it is not of private interpretation. You cannot make it your own private interpretation. But holy men of God spoke as they were born by the Holy Spirit. 
God revealed his truth, brought to their minds all that he taught them, put it down into language, and carried it through history so that today you and I can read Genesis 1, in the beginning God created. We can read John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Only in the Christian faith do we have propositional truth, incarnational truth, and transformational verification by what God can say to you and to me. So we have truth, which is the most valuable thing in the world. You can find it in correspondence, and you can find it in coherence, and you can find it in relevance. Corresponding to reality, coherent in its total teaching, and in its application brings relevance and meaning to your life and mine. You may not have a perfect understanding, but you can have a meaningful understanding, and that is what the scriptures want from you and from me. Okay. Next question. Okay, the next question says, are all religions the same in that they all ultimately lead to one place, one God, who is the father of all? Are all religions the same? Are all religions the same? I can give you a brief answer. The answer is no. If, it were not, if they were all the same, why create another one? The reason we believe in the law of non-contradiction is because two contradictory and mutually exclusive statements simply cannot be true. So let me put it this way. We hear it said all religions are fundamentally the same and superficially different. The reverse is true. They are fundamentally different and sometimes only superficially maybe similar. Why do I say this? You take the great teachings of Gautama Buddha. Buddha never made a single statement about God. Buddhism is atheistic. Most of the Eastern religions are pantheistic, that ultimately you become identical with the divine, union with the divine. In Jesus Christ, that is not true. You do not become identical with the divine and union with the divine. We have communion with God, and he calls us to follow him. Only in the Christian faith, hear me very carefully, only in the Christian faith there are three fundamental truths that are very, very unique, not claimed by any other. God in love pursues you. Not just compassionately, but with love. He pursues you with genuine love because you are of value to the living God. He talks about the lost sheep and the lost boy and the shepherd leaving 99 going looking for the one sheep to bring that sheep back to the fold. But the second thing is this, listen to me carefully please, only in the Christian faith do you not earn your salvation. It is the gift of God and of grace and mercy from him. You cannot earn your way to heaven in the gospel story. In fact, it is not your righteousness that gets you into heaven. It is the mercy and the grace of God that forgives you and forgives me. That reality of grace is throughout the Holy Scriptures. And it is the only faith I know of in the world where this is the sequence. First, he brings them out of Egypt. Then he brings them through the wilderness and wilderness and gives them the Ten Commandments. Then he gives them the tabernacle for worship. Redemption, righteousness, worship. Redemption, righteousness, worship. That is the logic. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall have no other gods before me. You do not attain heaven by the keeping of the law. You are redeemed first before you become righteous. You are redeemed and righteous for who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord but he that had clean hands and a pure heart. The grace of God is indispensable for righteousness. You cannot earn it. It is the gift of God given to you and me. Ask any other worldview, any other worldview. Your good deeds will have to outweigh your bad deeds or your karma will have to be paid in this life for the previous life. Not so in the Christian faith. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all 
unrighteousness. He that has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life and surely will come into condemnation. The fundamental truths of the Christian faith start with love, move through grace, and are manifested in a relationship. You are called to a relationship with God. Let me give you an illustration of this. My grandson Jude is five years old. When he was about three and a half or so, his mother, my second daughter Naomi, had lost her car keys in her house and couldn't find them. And she got so frustrated, she slapped her forehead and said, I must be losing my mind. Jude comes and stands in front of her. He said, Mommy, whatever you do, don't lose your heart because I am in there. <laughs> Who told him to say that? From the time you are a child, you long for a relationship. You long to be embraced. I remember a, a woman, a soldier with the US Army who'd come back from Afghanistan who'd lost both of her legs and she'd been given prosthetics so that she could stand again with those steel limbs. Somebody said to her, what is the best part of you being able to walk again? If you didn't see the interview, you will never guess at the answer. She said, being able to be hugged once more. That somebody can hug you once again, which she said was very difficult when I couldn't even stand to my feet. Every human being needs that embrace. Every human being needs that relationship only in Jesus Christ. His love pursues you. His grace forgives you and his strength carries you through in a relationship with the living God. You will not hear this anywhere else from any other claimant to divine or prophetic status. So they're not the same. They are fundamentally different, at best superficially maybe similar. Many of them may have good pointers to them. And the way I look at it is this. My, in my home growing up, I had, we had a man who was our cook. His name was Aramogam. Aramogam in Tamil literally means six faces. He'd never seen a movie in his life. So my mother went and bought him a ticket to go to the movie theater. And in India, if you've not seen a movie, you've not been an Indian. And so <laughs> he wanted to go and see a movie. She bought him the ticket, he polished his shoes, put on his white shirt and white trousers, and marched off. He came back about three hours later. I said, Aramogam, how was the movie? He said, yo, 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 yo. He flapped his mouth. He said, I made a big mistake. I said, what was that? He said, I walked in late, and I walked in through the back door. And when I walked into the door, I was looking at a wall, and I just saw beams of light coming out of the wall. And he thought, why have I paid money to see beams of light coming from a hole in the wall? And then suddenly I turned around and saw faces. And I screamed out so loudly, the usher came and quietened me down and gave me my seat. You see, many worldviews are looking at the wrong wall. They may see a beam of light here and there. When you look at the face of Jesus Christ, you know where all the light funnels off, obviously, and all of those panels of light point to him and see the culminating completion in him alone shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. In him you have life and life eternal, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us full of grace and truth. There may be hints in other worldviews as the only culmination in the incarnation and the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's my answer for you, yeah. Now, uh, Ravi, somebody asks, how can I tell those people who feel like they really don't exist, that they really are significant in God's eyes, especially those people maybe who have even tried to commit suicide many times? I remember uh, speaking at the University of Florida years ago in Gainesville. And after I'd finished talking, a fellow went up to the microphone and said, how do I know that I exist? <laughs> I told him the same question was asked of the professor of philosophy at the University of New York. How do I know that I exist? And Professor Nathan lowered his glasses and said, and who, shall I say, is asking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I remember being in Moscow, speaking at the Lenin Military Academy, and while I was speaking, there was a guy going like this the whole time, trying to tell me to choke. Uh, it's okay, I just look in another direction and I keep going. <laughs> and at the end of it, he stood up and he said, for 45 minutes here, you've been talking about God, 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 God. He said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I said, are you an atheist? He said, yes. I said, what are you denying? <laughs> and he just looked at me. I said, the alpha is the negative. Theist is for theos, no God. You say you believe there's no God. What is it you don't believe in? Have you not defined some term out there? You see, deep inside when a person says, how do I know that I really exist? Deep inside, they are not asking whether I'm living in this body or not. They are really asking, how do I know I'm of any value or any worth or any significance? And I give them four pillars on which to build their life. Eternity, morality, accountability, and charity. You don't only live for the moment. You differentiate between right and wrong. You are accountable to Almighty God, and you live a life of love and sharing. Let me illustrate this for you. Some years ago, I was vacationing in Honolulu in Hawaii. My wife and I were there. And not far from Honolulu is an island called Molokai. It's about 25 minutes. You take a small plane, and you land there. The world's tallest sea cliffs in Molokai. The reason I wanted to go to Molokai is because I read the biography of a man called Joseph Damien, who had left his home country of Belgium. His brother had wanted to go to Molokai because all of the people with leprosy had been from the Hawaiian Islands were sent to Molokai. He gave them a beautiful island, but with that dreaded disease was the only qualifier. His brother passed away, Damien, and so his brother on his deathbed asked Damien if he would go and take his place because he wanted to go and find a cure for people with leprosy. Damien went. I've read his biography, he's beautiful. He, would, he built a chapel, he talked to them about Christ, and he loved them. One morning he took a kettle of water and he was pouring it into a cup and the water swirled out of that cup and fell onto his bare foot. It took him a moment to realize he didn't feel it. He took it and poured it onto the other foot. He didn't feel it again. Boiling water. He knew what had happened. He'd contracted leprosy. That morning, nobody in the audience knew why he changed his opening line. He always began with my fellow believers. This morning, he began with my fellow lepers. They didn't know till he shared the story. And if you see his picture under the scourge of leprosy, his whole countenance changed. He died in Molokai. And if you go to Molokai, you'll see a grave marker, Joseph Damien. So the man who was showing us around, I said, is Damien buried here? He said, no. I said, then why do you have the grave marker? He said, he was buried. But the Belgian people said he was a hero. Please send him back to his native land. The Hawaiians with leprosy said, no, he came here to make this place his home, and he loved us. Please don't take him back. But the Belgian government insisted. So they asked for permission to cut off his right hand or the right arm and keep that in the grave. They say because it was the only hand for all those years that ever chose to touch us. The only hand that ever chose to touch us. When your body is breaking down under leprosy and you are an outcast and a hand reaches out and, and touches you, it brings tears into your eyes because you say, why do you treat me with this affection? We all hunger for significance. We all long for dignity and the touch of love. Only in the gospel do you see a savior who walks around and touches the lepers and heals the blind and looks at a woman with five broken marriages and makes her the first evangelist to the Samaritan people who looks at a woman who brings alabaster ointment, which was so expensive, probably gained from her prostitution, 
He never asked her where she got it. She poured the ointment on him, and he said to the self-righteous, he said, if a person is forgiven 50 and a person is forgiven 500, who will love the creditor more? So the one who's given 500, forgiven 500, he said, you're looking at her. And he paid her the greatest compliment he paid to anybody who encountered him. He said, wherever the gospel is preached, shall this story also be told of what this woman has done, done to me. He took the insignificant and the marginalized of his time. The Samaritan people were a mongrel people. They were not accepted as having any pedigree. He told the good Samaritan story send the woman back to them and took a woman who was a woman of the night and put her under the light of forgiveness and great grace. You are significant to God and the church has to carry that message of significance to the weakest and the most fragile because he came to seek and save that which was lost. You and I are lost. Take the significance God gives you he treats you as valuable and sent his son for you so that you may be one of his children. That's my answer to you. Ravi, this is going to be our last question. In this time in our world with rising tensions, how should we as believers act? I have traveled as an itinerant for 45 years. I started when I was 26, full time. I'd actually done it for four years even before that, when I was in under, doing my undergrad and so on. I have never seen the world in such chaos. In fact, my wife this morning, she began with a line saying, I think the whole world is going mad. I talk to political leaders when I go and they will tell you they have no answers. Politics never has the answer because politics gets rooted in power and control. It doesn't change the human heart. Yeah, we need to have it to learn to live in civility. But let me give you a conversation I had as my answer to you and then make an application. This, by the way, all of the questions have been very good. Very good questions. Thank you. This one is the most relevant for our time, for you as young people. How do you live in a world that's falling apart while weapons of warfare pile up and the young have no hope? In many countries, the young are being smothered by oppressive leadership and they don't see the days of hope and study and building their own careers in a free world. So let me give you my answer. First of all, I want to tell you, no matter how dark it gets, don't ever get desperate. The world has seen dark days before. It was in 1939 when King George VI, who had a stuttering problem, and the world was on the brink of the Second World War, and nobody knew what was going to come out of all of that. He went to the microphone to speak to the world in 1939. And before he went there, a piece of paper was given to him by his 12-year-old daughter, the present Queen Elizabeth. And in his speech, he quoted what his 12-year-old daughter had given to him from what she'd read. Listen, I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. And he said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. He said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. How do you put your hand into the hand of God? with this, begin every day with his word, end every day with his word. He speaks to you and comforts you and gives you hope. Don't ever get buried in despair. History can change in a flash with one person changing the future. So that's the first thing I say to you. But the second thing I say to you is this, what hope do you have for the future? Jesus. 
Christ who changes hearts and will bring peace. He is the only hope. Live for him if you have to die for him. But let your light shine amongst this people in a dark world that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I believe 20 years ago, nobody would have guessed that one day China would be the fastest growing church in the world. Nobody guessed it. 20 years from now, we might say nobody would have ever guessed how God was going to change the nations of the earth and he was going to do it through the young like you. Take a stand. Live the life. He can use you to change those who change history. The Russian KGB agent on Fox last night looked at Varney and said to him, what it is going to change this world is a good dose of Christianity. I would just change one word. It's a heavy dose of Christ. It's not a religion that will change. It's the person of Jesus Christ who is the Redeemer. Hey, it's been great being with you all. Wonderful being here. Thanks so much. And God bless you.